Um, today we're going to look at this idea of belief. Um, what does it mean to believe something? Why is belief important? Um, John 3.16, which many of us would know well, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Um, what does, like, why is belief so important? Um, I was thinking about it, and, you know, I really, really like the idea of universalism, universal, universal Christianity, which basically says, it takes the text where, where um, it says, by the sins of one man, the many were made sinners, and by the death of one perfect man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the many were made righteous. And it says, there you go, um, all are righteous, all are saved, and so therefore the gospel is that Jesus died for the sins of all humanity. Um, so if that's the case, why does the mainstream of Christianity say that it isn't just everybody's saved because Jesus died on the cross, just like everybody's a sinner because Adam sinned? What's the difference? And the difference lies in that word belief. He who believes and then it's credited to him as righteousness. There's something amazing that happens, and science is studying this and figuring out how the brain works and everything, but when someone believes something at a, a molecular level, it starts changing them, and it causes them to be more capable of doing things because they believe they can. It causes them to be more committed to things because they believe it's true, believe it's important, and it literally causes them to change. And this is why I believe belief is so important in the Gospels and why in, in all of the New Testament it's important not just to say there is a God, but to believe that God has saved you through the death and resurrection of his, his son, Jesus. And to look at this today, I thought what we could do is we'll continue. We were talking about Paul before, about Paul being in the... Um, prison, and uh, remember he went to Philippi, and when he got there, there was no Jewish synagogue in Philippi, and yet he met this Jewish lady when he was down by the river on a Sabbath, and he went down there because there was no synagogue. He said, where do the Jews meet? Because that was always Paul's first um, approach with the gospel was to go find the Jews, because it was the, the smallest leap from Judaism to Christianity, because it had the same foundational faith and same the same God, um, where other religions, Paul had to do more connective tissue work. He had to find, you know, the unknown God um, to connect through to them. And so he's looking for, for Jewish people, and he finds that they go down to meet by the river in, in, uh, in Philippi. And so he goes down there on a Sabbath, and he's, he's sitting with them and having a discussion. And this one, named, one lady named Lydia, who was a wealthy lady that lived in the city, after talking to him for some time, she says, she kind of does a reversal of the gospel. And she says, if you believe that I believe in the Jewish God, then come to my home. And so Paul and Silas and Luke and whoever else is there with them, they all pop up and they go. And they go to Lydia's house. And... Lydia's house is where the first Christian church in Philippi starts. And then as they're working their way around the city, this little girl is, is or a teenager, we're not sure, but a young woman, she's following them and she's shouting. And you remember me talking to you this about a, a few episodes ago, where she says, these men are from the Most High God. They've come to tell you how to be saved. And then five minutes later, she's at it again. These men have come from the Most High God. They've come to tell you how to be saved. And finally, Paul casts the demon out of her and we don't have this in scripture, but it would be so unlike Paul to just let her walk away. He converts her to understanding who Jesus is. And, and I believe that she then says, um, well, that what I was saying, I've always been, my masters have been paid. And then I look at someone and I tell them what the, the demon has said is their future. And I repeat what the demon said, but I've been saying these men have come from the Most High God and they've come to tell you how to be saved. Not because I was paid to say it to anyone, but because it's what the demon was saying to me. The demon, I think, was the reason why it's coming out of her mouth is the demon is literally telling her these men have come from the Most High God and they're here to tell you how to be saved. And so when she is set free from this demon... Um, she follows God, and she becomes a follower, a Christian in the little tiny church that's growing. It's now doubled. In Philippi, we have Lydia, and we have this this girl. 
And then Paul goes to prison because of what he's done in casting this demon out. And while he's in prison, midnight, he's singing and he's he's singing so beautifully. And all the other prisoners are listening, him and, and Silas. And and uh, as they're singing along um, and, and the other prisoners are all listening at midnight, the uh, angels get involved and join in and shake the place. An earthquake rattles through this little town of Philippi and terrorize, terrifies everyone. And, it, and yet it doesn't do any damage to the prison. It just does impossible things like shaking their manacles free, shaking their the stocks that are around their feet open, uh, shaking the doors that are locked, unlocked, and swinging open. Suddenly, all who were in prison in that prison are free in the, in the sense that they are unlocked and they are unbound and they're set free. And the jailer comes out and he sees the front door of the prison hanging open and he panics. He comes running down in the, you know, the moonlight and he's terrified that, of course, if the front door's open, then some prisoners could have got out. What if, what if one or two prisoners got loose somehow? And he comes down and as he runs into the front of the jail, he sees all the doors in the darkness swinging open and catching the moonlight, these doors. And he pulls his sword out or his knife to kill himself because... Every single penalty that was supposed to go to the men who were in those cells would now become his penalty because that was Roman law. If you let a prisoner, a Roman prisoner free, you take his punishment. All his prisoners are gone. Paul says, wait, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Who knows what they were singing, but whatever they were singing, it so captivated the prisoners, the other prisoners, that when they were set free, they didn't just leave. They listened and Paul said, hey, guys, we're here for a reason. You know what you've done. You shouldn't be free unless you've done your time. You know, do the crime, do the time. And they all stayed. And so the jailer says, Give me, bring me a light. And they bring lights. And they, they walk in and they go through and they see every single prisoner saying, yep, yep, lock me back up, lock me back up. And so they all get locked back up. And then the jailer falls at, at the feet of Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? Why did he use that line? Well, he too had just heard this girl going around all of the town of Philippi for days, screaming out, these men have come from the Most High God and they're here to tell you how to be saved. And so what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on Christ who was crucified and be baptized. And then Paul is invited, Paul and Silas are invited into the jailer's home he talks to the jailer, talks with the jailer's wife, the jailer's children. They all give their lives to Jesus, and they're all baptized that night. And they all have a feast together to celebrate their new life in Christ. And then as the morning light is coming, Paul says, you should lock us back up so you don't get in trouble. And so the jailer locks them back up, and uh, they get set free later that day um, by the magistrate, who has to apologize before Paul will leave, because he said, you have no right to lock us up. So... These, this is the Church of Philippi, and this small church starts with Lydia and probably that girl, definitely the jailer and his family, and this small church starts growing. They start telling their stories. They start sharing their faith and in Jesus and telling how God's uh, mercy and love and, and what happened on the cross, why they believe and why it is, and it changes them from the inside out. And you know, nowadays when um, a church wants to uh, do church planting and they want to put a church in a new place, the first question is, well, who's going to pay for it? Nobody asked that in Philippi. You know why? Because everybody they didn't say to the people either, okay, now look, when you come here, we actually have this little policy. We put 10% aside, and you bring that 10%, and that's how we run the church. Now, it just says people started coming, and they brought everything. They said, what do you need? The jailer? probably had some wealth. Lydia certainly was wealthy. And everyone who came to the Christian faith just saw it as our mission is all of our mission. And so all that we have is all of ours. And if and what should we do with this wealth? Well, let's feed the poor. Let's care for the sick. Let's, let's heal those that we can heal. And let's teach about Jesus. And this kind of living draws people. And it drew a crowd. It drew many people. And the little church in Philippi began to grow. Years later... Paul is in prison, and it's probably in Rome. It's possible that there's a couple other places he could have been because he was in prison in lots of places. Everywhere that Paul went, they put him in prison because what he was doing was he was presenting a new faith. And 
in Jewish areas, presenting a new faith was just obvious heresy. That, that, that was just, you can't present a new faith because there's one true God, his name is Yahweh, and they followed him. So he would come in and he would come in as a Jew and then he would show them, and here's the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, and which means Messiah. And, and then he would lead them from there into uh, an understanding of Jesus as the Savior, and then they would become Christians or follow the way, as they called it in that day. And so... But when he went into places that were not Christ, not Jewish, um, he got in a lot of trouble because he was presenting another god. And they already had lots of gods. They had gods for everything. And so they had policies for how they decided if a god was a god. And they would listen to the person present, and they would decide whether the deity that they were talking about was really a deity or whether it was a, a false god. And so Paul got in trouble because he came in and he just started talking without permission about Jesus and about the um, freedom from sin and and really saying and all these other gods that you have they are all subservient to the one true God who is Yahweh and he sent his son Jesus and together they are th their spirit and they reign together and they are one in three and they're three in one and and Jesus died for our sins so you could be set free from all the sacrificial systems of whatever religion it is that you're bound up in. And this bothered them because there's a lot of money in religion and there was a lot of power in religion and Paul would come up, come in and upset their religions. Case in point, the, the girl that he cast the demon out of. That was part of their religious power that they could predict the future and, and Paul took it away from them by um, setting her free. So now Paul is in Rome and he's in chains once again and he writes a letter while he's in Rome to the Philippians the people in Philippi and this is the the letter obviously of Philippians and I wanted to have a little look at it today with you because something happens with Paul in prison that it gives us a really clear inclination of of what it means to believe something and how that belief changes you. And if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 1, we're just going to look at um, just a handful of verses, eight verses, chapter 1, verses 12 to 20. And I'm just going to read this through out of the um, Christian Standard Bible. And I want you to listen for what's going on in Paul's mind. He's in prison. He's writing a letter to the Philippians. How's he doing? He's, he's locked up in prison. How's he doing? Is he okay? How's his well-being? Is he feeling down about life and, and that, you know, why did God let this happen to me? Or is, is something else going on for him? Just have a listen and see where Paul's at. And um, I know where I would be if I was in prison um, and how I would be feeling about myself. Um, my God, why God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, but listen for Paul. Listen to what he has to say. Now, I want you to know, remember, this is a letter he's dictating to someone, probably Luke, who's on the outside of the bars, and he's writing it down, and the, the, prisoner, the prison guards are listening, and the other prisoners are listening, as Paul, once again, is testifying of Jesus. So, he's saying this, and it's being written down, and this is going to be sent to Philippi. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard. How did, how did it get known through the whole Imperial Guard? Well, every six hours they change soldiers, and Paul tells the next guy, I have to tell you about how free I am in Christ. Said, you're not free, you're in chains. But let me tell you what I mean, how freeing it is to know that you are saved by the God of the universe. And so, again, another soldier. So that it has been known throughout the whole Imperial Guard, and to everyone else, that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. So you imagine people coming to visit Paul in prison 
And when they first get there, they're morose. They're, you know, long faces. And we're so sorry this has happened to you. We thought God was with you, but now you're stuck in prison and it must be so sad for you. And we're sad because you're sad and we're being careful out there. We're not talking about Jesus because we don't want anyone to put us in prison with you. And Paul says, oh my goodness, God has set me free by be putting me, by putting me in here. I am, I'm talking to Roman soldiers. Like they're just, they have to listen to me. And and I'm telling them about Jesus. I'm telling them about Peter and, and, and I'm telling them about uh, the, the walking on the water and I'm telling them all the stories about Jesus and they're loving it. And you know what? There's Christians now that are Roman soldiers. They believe in Jesus. So, man, I'm not upset that I'm in here. You don't be upset that I'm in here. You go out there and you be bold in your faith because God's put me here so I could talk to these guys. They would never be available to talk to if I was out there. But in here, they have to listen to me. And so Paul says in in that verse, um, most of the brothers have gained confidence, is verse 14 of Philippians 1. Most of the brothers, fellow believers, have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Verse 15. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. So so what Paul says, basically, there are some who come and visit him, some Christians who come and, and visit him, and they take... Uh, they they take encouragement from the fact that he's he's brave he's he's bold in prison and he's feeling purpose filled even though he's joyful he's joyful even in his chains and so they come out joyful and they say we can be joyful in in our chains of being in Rome and knowing we're we're it's risky ground to talk about this new religion but we'll do it anyway because Paul he's in chains and and he's okay so there's the bold and brave ones and then there's the ones who Paul says they are out there and they're using the fact that I'm in here to make themselves feel better. They're still preaching Christ and him crucified, but they're doing it pridefully. They're they're basically they were saying, you know, Paul is in prison because well, he didn't do it right. We're not in prison because we're sharing the gospel the right way and 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 it's spreading through Rome because of us. And if Paul was out and what they knew was if Paul was out here, he'd get all the kudos and the pats on the back. And so they're glad he's in prison because it's giving them a chance to um, exercise their evangelistic skills. And um, they're probably preachers. And what's interesting is Paul doesn't say that they're they're bad. He doesn't say that they're um, they're teaching false teaching. He saves that later in Philipp in Philippians for the Judaizers, the ones who are saying you're saved by the law and obeying the law. He tears holes in them, and he says that that's false teaching. But these guys, he says, they're teaching the gospel. They're just teaching it pridefully, and and they're teaching that that my incarceration is to their benefit. And then he continues, and this is how you know that he's he's not actually bitter about them. So he says, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true motives, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayer and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by my life or by my death. So, this letter goes from Paul and Romans back to Philippi, and they read, Paul's in prison, and it is increasing the reach of the gospel because he's in there. He's preaching to the the jailers. He's preaching to the soldiers. He's the, the entire Praetorian Guard knows about Jesus, about Christ and him crucified, because Paul is in prison, and Paul is joyful about this. And how would it make you feel receiving this letter? Well, you would be uh, 
buoyed up. Even if you were a little prideful and you thought, well, I'm kind of glad that I'm, I'm able to help lead this church here in Philippi. If Paul was here, he'd get all the attention. Paul's saying, that's okay. And, you know, in other places, Paul says, I'm a, the chief of sinners. And it's not that because I'm perfect that Christ is using me. Christ uses me in my chains. He uses me the way that I am, whatever it is that locks me up. And for some people, it's their pride. And it's their jealousy of people that are um, like Paul, who are uh, empowered by the Spirit to be able to speak in faith all the time. And that jealousy can become their own bitterness. But what Paul illustrates so beautifully in this passage is that when a Christian believes in Christ and him crucified, it changes the way they think about every single uh, involvement, that they, every single encounter that they come to. Rather than thinking, how is this restricting me? How is this saying something negative about me? They say, how is this an opportunity to share the love of God? How is this in an opportunity to share Christ and him crucified? How is the fact that we are servants of the most high God able to be connected through this moment? How are these chains? They limit me, but how do they, you know what chains do? When you have a soul focus, they just make you focus more right there. You can't go anywhere else, you're chained up. Well, then suddenly, Whoever you can see or you can talk to becomes number one goal. And that's what Paul did. Paul, in his chains, became more powerful for the gospel because he was he was full on. He never turned off the gospel tap. And he told that story over and over and over. And he applied it to whoever he was talking to. And so when he was talking to the Roman guard, he talked about it through Roman mindset ideas. When he was talking to Jewish people, he talked about it through the Old Testament. When he was talking to, uh, to you know, priestesses of other religions, he talked about it from their understanding. And Paul had this drive, this constant compulsion to share Christ. And, and he basically said, there's only one thing that I need to do this. I can let go of everything else. And if you send me into a place just with Christ and him crucified, if that's all I'm able to take with me, that's enough. Because then I can connect to them. I'll listen to them. I'll ask questions. I'll say, where is your life going? Where, where are you struggling? And then I will connect through the salvation that we have through Christ Jesus to them and show them how it is the most joyful thing they can participate in and it will set them free. So the challenge I would like to leave you with today from this is where are you in chains? We're all in chains in some area of our life. There's something you, you wish you could be disconnected from, something, someone you wish that didn't have that power over you or some aspect of, of life where you feel you're just, you're unable to be included, involved, um, free. And how can you take that to Jesus and say, I believe in you. I give you these chains. I give you this place where I am. And I ask you to be my sole purpose while I am in these chains. And if you do that, if you allow God to use your in, you in your chains, you will no longer focus on why didn't God do what needed to be done so that I wasn't here. But instead, you'll be focused on what is God going to do through me because I'm here. And with that mindset, you will change the world just like Paul did, from inside your prison cell. And it will ripple out, it will have effects on everyone who comes to see you, everyone who talks about you, and your joy, be joyful in all things. You know, it will spread because you are in Christ. He is in you, and you are changing the world one relationship at a time for him.